Amen. Just a couple things to put in place before I try to return to my notes. Um, following up on what Brother Tabo was just sharing, when you're looking at this history of the Battle of Actium, for years I've taught the Battle of Actium was 31 BC and that Rome ruled the world supremely for 360 years and that the kingdom was divided in 330 AD. And no one ever challenged me on that. I always wondered about it um, because that's 361 years. But we got away with it. But now that the Lord has taken us into these verses more carefully, we're finding a little bit more specific information that in the fall of 31 BC is the Battle of Actium. But the work that's being illustrated there isn't over until they take control of Egypt in the year 30 BC. And then when you get down here to 330, A.D., technically, Constantine has legally, by an act, moved the capital to Constantinople in 329, but he gets over there in 330. So you have, in this time prophecy of 360 years, you've got one of these prophecies that's got a couple years at the beginning and a couple years at the end, but it's still 360, so it's valid. And what Brother Tabo was talking about in verse 24, there's a time, 360 years, and then in verse 27 and 29, it talks about the appointed time, and we're placing the appointed time over here at the Sunday Law. And I want to remind you as a secondary witness to this, an important secondary witness to this, is that the Sunday Law is typified by October 22, 1844, which is the time appointed that we were, the pioneers were to wait for, though the vision, Terry, wait for it because it is for an appointed time. So when we're taking the appointed time of these 360 our, and putting it at the Sunday Law, our secondary witness to that is October 22nd, 1844, is the appointed time of the vision, and it lines up here as well. And Brother Tabo mentioned that um, the two returnings that Uriah Smith spoke about was... Augustus returning from defeating Mark Antony, and uh, was it Augustus, Octavius, Octavius? And he, he talked about the conquering of Jerusalem in 63 BC, but that wasn't, that's not correct. It's the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 that was the second returning, which, which is worth making sure that we get because the destruction of Jerusalem also is a typification of the Sunday law. Um, now, if you remembered last night, let me go over here. I don't know that, I want to go over this just one more time. You could use this line to just build thought after thought after thought upon. But one of the things that's illustrated in this history here, if you follow this logic, is that after the United States passes a Sunday law, the, Sister White says, Every country on the globe is going to be led to follow the example of the United States. And before the United States passes a Sunday law here, you have the image of the beast testing time. So when this history is repeated in the world, you've got the, the, the image of the beast testing time from the Sunday law until you get over here to when the Sunday law becomes universal, Michael stands up and human probation closes. So you've got the image of the beast testing time going on here represented by these 25 men bowing down to the sun. But this is the image of the beast testing time for the 11th hour workers. Okay. But there's been an image of the beast testing time in this history in the United States. Okay. For the 11th hour workers, this image of the beast testing time in the United States is their awakening. This is where they're awakening. That's what Brother Tabo was saying. It's the plowing. They're getting... They're getting familiarized with the events that are going to hit, that are going to test them right here. So there, there's an advance preparation for the 11th hour workers to go through this testing time. So when you pull the fractal down to the Levites, they're going to have this, this image of the beast testing time, that, that, which for the Levites is their testing time. But they will have a, a prior period where they're going to be plowed or awakened from midnight to the midnight cry. The same one, because God's dealing with men is ever the same. So if this is the testing time for the 11th hour worker, 
and it's the testing cot time of the image of the beast being set up in the world. And there's a period of time just before it where the image of the beast is being set up in the United States, and this is their point of reference to know how they're to stand in this testing time. Then when you bring it down to the Levites, their testing time from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, which was, is the primary time that we point to as the image of the beast testing time, they will have had a image of the beast testing time that comes before to plow them, to awaken them, to prepare the Levites to make the right choice. You follow the logic? Say amen if you follow the logic. Okay. All right. So if we bring it down to our level, um, it's from midnight to the midnight cry, um, where the priests are going to be in that testing time. But before they get there, what are they going to have to have? They're going to have to see an image of the beast testing time to awaken them to the fact of what their test is just ahead. Okay, so I didn't, if you didn't get what I said last night, it, it might be the most serious thing from my perspective I've said, that I'll say all week. Pardon me? Uh, the, it, 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 there has to be something before, right? Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. If, there's, if, there, if this is their testing time of the image of the beast and there's been a prior image of the beast testing time and it's the same also with the Levites, then for the priests, their testing time is going to be in here, right? So before midnight, before midnight, you're going to have to see some kind of illustration of the image of the beast. And Sister White says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the formation of the image of the beast, the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. Our probation closes here, for it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. So what I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, is that when the Republicans took control of the House of Representatives, the Senate, the Presidency, and the Supreme Court on November 8th of last year, the apostate Protestants in the United States now have control of all three branches of government that is not a minor step towards the image of the beast. That is a major step. And we're to see that. We're to recognize that back in this history, the first, not, maybe not the first, but a major step, that the image of the beast is being formed. Okay, that's, that's why when Brother Tabo was saying yesterday, he was marking, and, I, and he was marking it correctly, but he was saying it kind of as a point in time that the image of the beast is here, that I got up afterwards and made the point that, no, the image of the beast is a process. Okay, this is the visual test, right? Everyone understands that this is the visual test. For, for any of these areas, this is the third test, right? This is where your probation closes. Sunday law, midnight, cry, midnight. You follow that? So you're going to have a visual test before that. You follow? Because the second test is always visual. So what I'm saying in a more simple fashion is that on November 8, 2016, the animals began to get on the ark here in the United States. It takes some time for them to get on the ark, but we're informed that the final movements will be rapid ones. Okay, so if you leave here with anything, leave here with that. Okay, now, in this history, though, in this visual testing time, which is the image of the beast testing time, it might be easier to put it over here to explain it over here. We have a doubling at the midnight cry, and in, in this history, in Daniel 11, and I'm not, I'm not including up here... Uh, the trumpets. The trumpets fit in there. I agree with this, with the Huns. But in Daniel 11 alone, you have two battles that you place at the midnight cry. Actium is a sea battle. Paneum is a land battle. And IUM is simply a grammatic term that you add to a, a noun in the Greek to do something to that noun. So if you eliminate this, this grammatical expression, then you have two battles. 
a sea battle and a land battle here that mark the midnight cry, and you often see a doubling at the midnight cry. And the one battle is the act. This is the first Sunday law act. Okay, and it's, it's representing the image of the beast, which is a test by which our eternal destiny will be decided, the coming together of church and state. But paneum, when you chase, trace the root word paneum, it's talking about counterfeit religion. Okay, uh, pan, pantheism, the goat god, the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement when the door closes. So this here, this, these two battles are representing two tests in this history. One test is the image of the beast test that begins with the act of this first Sunday law. And sometimes we call a, act, a law an act. Okay? The other one, this is the strong delusion. This is, here, this is talking about the religious uh, separation of two classes. And it's a test. Okay? And the test is whether you're going to receive a love for the truth or you're not going to receive the love of the truth. So in this history, you've got two tests. You've got this strong delusion, this uh, religious delusion that's testing whatever, whatever class. Okay, so it'd be over here. In both of these classes, you're going to be tested. We've already agreed with the image of the beast. That's act. That's the act. But you're also going to be tested with the strong delusion because in Ezekiel 8, this is the weeping for Tammuz. This is the strong delusion, okay? But if you have a counterfeit rain falling, then you have a genuine rain falling. So in this time period, the genuine rain is a message. And the message that's falling in advance of midnight, this is another point that we've been trying to make here. The message that falls before midnight is May 2nd of 1844, when Samuel Snow makes a public prediction about October 22nd, 1844, before he gets to Boston on July 21st. There's a prediction before midnight. Okay, what we've been trying to share here is the first 39 verses of Daniel 11 is that prediction. And of course, you know, you know that from 9-11, probably you know, from 9-11, to midnight, you can, you can lay 40 in there, can't you? Okay, so when you, get to, when you put 40 in here, when you get to the 40th in this history from 9-11 to, midnight, to midnight, when you get to 40, the door closes, right? So I don't think it's an accident that the message, the final message, the midnight cry message, is represented in the first 39 verses when you get to here. The door closes. Okay, it's covering this history, this testing process of where this message of the last six verses of Daniel 11 is brought to perfection the same way that William Miller's message of the Judgment Hour was brought to perfection before the door closed on October 22nd, 1844. So you're seeing two lines of truth here that are identifying that a double testing is underway for us here at the end of the world. The testing that is being represented is, is represented by what's going on in the political arena in the United States um, and what's going on in the religious re arena with the Omega apostasy. Okay, the, the brother Duane brought something up that I, I figure I might as well put in the record here. It's old news. But sometimes the old light is nice to refresh us on. And I'll start by drawing it out because the initial line is more difficult for you to follow. When, we've, when we first started dealing with Revelation 17, we got resistance from everyone. Everyone had, not everyone, but most, most entities that would oppose a, a doctrinal presentation in Adventism. And at that time, this movement was not so alienated from the Seventh-day Adventist Church that there wasn't even, there were still Seventh-day Adventist conference people that were telling us why we were wrong. Okay, they don't, they don't worry about it anymore. But when we were in Revelation 17, we were getting input about why we, how we were applying it was wrong on several levels. And whether you know it or not, this, the position of the theologians in the Adventist Church on Revelation 17 is wrong. 
But what was, what's nice about it being wrong is it's wrong in a way that you can show that it's partially wrong because they reject the spirit of prophecy in their position. But here's what I mean by that. The, the doctrinal position of the Adventist church, you know the riddle in Revelation 17, five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, but the, in the eighth is of the seven, that riddle. Well, they say it begins with Assyria. They say it's dealing with the kingdoms of history. Assyria, Babylon, no, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and it's been so long, I, I don't know if they include pagan Rome or just Rome, and then papal Rome, but that isn't the point that, that I need to make anyway. But they go down, five have fallen, Assyria, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, five have fallen, and John is on the Isle of Patmos in the time that pagan Rome is ruling the world. One is, and one is yet to come, and I don't remember what they claim the eighth is. But my point is, is you know they're not right, because in the book Education, Sister White says the kingdoms of history are Assyria, Egypt, Israel, and Babylon. So they've rejected the inspired identification of what the kingdoms of history are, so you know they can't be right as they apply it. But because of that, if you, if you accept them at face value, then what it does do for you, if you add inspiration into it and put Israel in here, it creates a, a pattern that is throughout Scripture. And it's this, when it comes to Rome, Rome always comes up eighth and is of the seven. Okay, even in history. Assyria, Egypt, Israel, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece is sixth, pagan Rome is seventh, papal Rome is eighth, but papal Rome came out of pagan Rome. So Rome comes up eighth and is of the seven. Okay, that's, that's outside scripture. That's just history. But if you go to Daniel 7, and this is the easy ones to walk through. I'm just going to do it with my fingers, and you'll all, you'll all know this. In Daniel 7, pagan Rome disintegrates into ten kingdoms, right? Ten nations in Western Europe. If you know that, say amen. amen. Okay, but three of those horns are going to get plucked up. The Heroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. That leaves seven. But the reason those three horns got plucked up is because the little horn, the papacy, is going to come up in their place. So in Daniel 7, there's 10, it goes down to 7, and the, the eighth, the papacy comes up. But these are the nations in Western Europe, and the papacy comes up in Italy. So in Daniel 7, papal Rome comes up eighth and is of the seven. Okay. So in Daniel 8, you have begins with the Medes and the Persians, and they are a ram, right? And how many horns are on that ram? Two horns. And then you have the, the he-goat. How many horns does he have? One horn. But that horn is broken, and how many horns come up out of that horn? That makes seven. And that gets you to verse 9 of Daniel 8. And in Daniel 8, the little horn comes up. And who's the little horn? According to the pioneers, it's pagan and papal Rome. But in any case, in Daniel 8, pagan and papal Rome comes up eighth and is of the seven. Okay, so, so if you go to Revelation 17. Oh, no. Yes, but Revelation 17 is it's one of the leaves of my Bible that is... So I'm going to try to read through this without only, with only having the right side of the verse. This would be verse 10. And there are... I might know it, but I'll, okay. I, I got it. Thank you. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is, and the other is yet, not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Kings or kingdom. So we understand that the seven kings here are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Sorry, 
Sister Vicky. All right. So five have fallen, and John in, in verse 3 is carried into the wilderness, and he's carried into 1798. In 1798, five have fallen, and one is, and the, the one that is in 1798 is the United States, and the one that is yet to come is the Ten Kings, which is the United Nations, and in verse 11, it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. So who's this eighth beast? Who's it got to be? It's got to be Rome, because Rome always comes up eight and is of the seven. And eight is the symbol of resurrection. All right? In circumcision, it was replaced by baptism. Baptism. And the, the scriptures tell us that uh, the Noah went from the old world to the new world, baptized, um, and there was eight people on the ark. And circumcision was to take place on the eighth day. And prophetically, Christ was resurrected on the eighth day. And this eighth kingdom is of the seven. It's of the one that has the deadly wound. Papal Rome was Killed here in 1798. Eight is the symbol of resurrection. It's of this one. So Rome comes up eight and is of the seven. But Revelation 17, and there's more you can say about this, is actually telling you how the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy comes together. So in reality, these are all part of the final kingdom, which is the kingdom of 666, the sixth kingdom. How the false prophet comes together with the dragon and places modern Rome on the throne of the earth. Okay. Now, the reason that I took the time there is because Brother Dwayne asked me a question that I want to add into this before I get to my material. I didn't take time with it last night, but maybe you will remember it. There are seven presidents that lead to the Articles of Confederation. But this seventh president here, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven. This seventh president, he's a president when there is no constitution, but he's the president when there is a constitution. He's, he's there as president before they finalize the Articles of Confederation, but he's there once they're in place. So he's at one level, he's the seventh, but at another level, he's the eighth. Okay? And he's of the seven because he's, he's the same guy. All right? He, this, this guy here is also the first of ten, this, this eight being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten presidents that will be in existence with a constitution. This is the Articles of Confederation right here. And then you get to 1789. And you have the first president, Washington. Okay, now, the reason I took the tr trouble for that is this, this formula here at the beginning of this chiastic structure. This eighth president, he comes up eighth. I'm not saying he's Rome. But he comes up eighth, and he's of the seven. But Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And this is a chiastic structure. This first president, Washington, the richest president, real estate, uh, what do they call it, mogul? Mogul? Mogul, um, typifying Donald Trump, richest president, real estate mogul. Uh, both of them, longest time period to put their cabinet in place. Okay. When you get down to his history, number 45, which would be right over here. Okay. Right. In fact, just because we can, let's go ahead and mark this. November 8th, 2016, because at this point, the Protestants of the United States have taken control of the government of the United States, which they have to do in order to pass a Sunday law. Uh, to the point. We actually found out that he won officially on 9th, on November 9th. Oh, you, got a, you got some, you want to be at... I'm not worried about when he, okay, some other time. There's, there's little nuances that you want to argue for. We're not going to do it right now. 
Okay, so when you get to here at midnight, where you're, I've known him for a while, so he's not, he's not, I'm not treating him mean, okay? This is just how we interact with one another. All right, this is midnight. This is midnight cry. And as Brother Tabos pointed out, and if you're not familiar with Revelation 16, it might go over your head, but this, this is the sixth kingdom, the United States, of Revelation 17, the sixth kingdom. It's going down while the seventh kingdom is ascending here. And at the Sunday law, Sister White says the threefold union is in place. Okay, you've got more than one witness where Sister White says that. But you've got you to understand that closely because in Revelation 17.10, it says these ten kings are going to rule for a short space. Another verse says for one hour. But in verse 17, it says they're going to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast. And the beast is the eighth. So when these ten kings come into power, they pretty much immediately surrender their world structure, their world uh, civil structure, into the moral authority of the papacy. It's a very quick movement that takes place down here. So what I'm saying is when you get to this history here, you're in the history of Donald Trump, you're in the history of the last president, and because this is a chiasm, you're going to see him very quickly become part of these ten kings, and very quickly the threefold union is going to be established. And at one level, you, you can take this and plug it right in at the Sunday Law. I'm spreading it out so you can see the chiastic structure. Okay, so, and once you take three, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet out of ten, you have this seven. So your structure is seven, ten, to the first president that typifies the last president that reaches a point to here. This is the tenth. He's becoming part of the tenth as he's going down. Right here, though, you're having the sixth kingdom ended, the seventh kingdom, the ten kings in place, and the eighth, which is of the seven, receiving that kingdom almost immediately. So what you have at this transition point, you'll have the same thing you have here, which is this riddle of Revelation 17. The eighth is of the seven, and... That's been illustrated here. Okay, so you're seeing the transition to the threefold union right here. The threefold union. But back here, you're going to see a threefold union typified. Back here, you're going to see a threefold union typified. Jesus is our example in all things, and he was arrested at midnight, and there was a threefold union. There was Judas, one of the twelve, uh, one of the disciples. And what makes Jesus, Judas a disciple? Well, lots of things, perhaps. But what, what, what you had to be to be a disciple is you had to be willing to recognize that when Christ was baptized, that, that he was the Christ. Okay, the disciples were the disciples of Christ. That's why Peter was allowed in Caesarea Philippi to give the, the statement that he gave, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, as he was the first to recognize that. If you're a disciple... You have to be able to recognize that your master is the Christ, okay? So when you get to, uh, I forgot what I was doing with that, with the 12 disciples. I know where I was going with that, but I forgot the, pardon me, the threefold, oh, the threefold union. When you, when you get to this, you have, thank you, you have Judas, one of the disciples, you have the Sanhedrin typifying the Seventh-day Adventist church, and you have pagan Rome typifying the government of the United States. So you've got a threefold union at midnight, and then it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, Brother Tabo put in place Ahab, Jezebel, and the elders of the city of Naboth. Okay? And Ahab in this history is the government of the United States. Okay, it's, it's the first to commit fornication with Jezebel and Jezebel's Catholic Church. It, at the midnight cry in the United States, the Catholic Church gets involved. Okay, they get involved in the sense that they're going to pass a Sunday law and the Catholics in the United States are going to say, Amen, go for it. Okay, and those that are, being, that are going to be dealt with at this point is the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the sense that they're going to realize by forming this league with the Jews back here at midnight, 
that now this league is going to be turned against them and they're going to have to accept this Sunday law and they're going to be regretting that they ever got into that relationship. But it's this action that awakens up the Levites that, hey, something's wrong in Adventism. The Seventh-day Adventist church just bought into a Sunday law. So there's a threefold union here, and it's between the United States, apostate Protestantism, and Catholicism. And who they're dealing with here is Seventh-day Adventists in general, okay? Because Seventh-day Adventists in general are now reaping what they sowed back here. And this threefold union here is typifying this threefold union that's typifying this threefold union, which is the global threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Okay, so that's in place. That, this, the eighth is of the seven. That's right here. And that's in agreement with this layout of, of these presidents. And it's in agreement with a, a pattern that is throughout the scriptures. Now, um, probably forgetting one thing or two things. But, oh yeah, one more thing. Good. Right here, right here, this is the beginning of the United Nations. If you remember last night, I think it was last night, we pointed out that 1793 was the beginning of the King of the South. First communist government in history takes King Louis XVI, chops his head off. From 1793 onward, this King of the South is heading toward deliver delivering the deadly wound to the papacy in 1798. It's doing other things, but just so you see who this King of the South is, he comes into history in 1793, and by five years later, he's delivering the deadly wound. And what is that? That's Daniel 11, verse 40. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at the papacy in 1798. Now, the, the, this is a reversal in this history here. Uh, in this history, what develops is Napoleon becomes the one that is going to deliver the deadly wound to the papacy. But in this history here from 1793, which is typifying the midnight cry, Donald Trump is then also typified by Napoleon. Because Donald Trump now is going to go to work, prophetically, to return the papacies to the throne of the earth. He's going to heal the deadly wound. Right here, 1793 introduces you to the, the military leader, Napoleon Bonaparte, that's going to deliver the deadly wound. And when you get to the end of 17 when you get to the end of the King of the South, where 1793 is typified, then you're also going to see the leader that's in this history heal the deadly wound. And you know this is so. You know the United States is the power that heals the deadly wound. So Napoleon Bonaparte is also typifying Trump. Okay? But here, in 1793, if you want to go look at the French Revolution, and you want to see it from a very nice perspective. I only say nice because they, they put the history out differently. You can go to websites where these communists who believe the French Revolution was the, the greatest event in history. They loved it. They praised it. Their only concern is that it didn't finish what it started, that it didn't win. So if you go onto those websites and you look at their history of the French Revolution, they, they approach it much different than every other historian. And there's a there's a, a lot of very good information in there. And you know what the, their strongest case is? Is that what the French Revolution did is it ended the feudal system. Okay, and the feudal system, and the more you look at it, the more you're going to realize how horrible it was. Okay, it's, it's slavery. All right, and we've already identified last night, or at least pointed to the fact that Sister White says slavery is going to return in 1793, at the beginning of the King of the South, the feudal system was done away with. So when you get to the end of that prophecy, at the midnight cry, the feudal system's coming back in. Okay, and there's a verse 39 of Daniel 11 talks about dividing the land for gain. Okay, it's, it's referencing, coming, bringing the whole ba world back in under this system of slavery. All right, so a lot of things going on here that should really alarm us, should really alarm us about the near future. 
Uh, so feudal systems returning, slavery is returning, dictatorships going to be put in place. Um, seven, sixth kingdom going down, seventh kingdom going up. Here is where the riddle of the eighth is of the seven takes place on more than one witness. This is the time appointed. Where did you place the first fornication? The first fornication is in the time of Ronald Reagan. Okay, that's, that's and the reason... Yes, there, I, I, it doesn't stop all the way along. But, and to, to, if you're going to build an argument about the significance of the United States being the firstborn of the Catholic Church, you go to France. Okay? And France, the French Revolution in Revelation 11 um, is identified in verse 13. And it says, in the same hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city, France, was one-tenth of those ten kingdoms of Europe. And it was overthrown by the earthquake that was the French Revolution. And the, in the earthquake were of men seven, slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. But France, being one-tenth of this kingdom, is typifying the United States. It's going to be one-tenth of, of these ten kings. And France was the firstborn of the Catholic Church, and the United States is the first king at the end of the world that commits fornication with the papacy, and it began that activity in the Ronald Reagan years as it formed a secret alliance to bring down the Soviet Union. Okay. Um, so here is an... Inter this is the, the only... Um, date on the chart that doesn't have a, a direct scriptural reference, right? No, that's, just, that's just when Antioch died. I mean, it's a difference in time. Uh, so, so what? So where does the Bible talk about Antioch is dying? Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just I'm letting you make the point for me. Okay, all these other issues on this chart, yeah, all these other... Symbols on this chart are drawn directly from God's word, but this one isn't, okay? For me, what this is a symbol of is the, the primary controversy in the Millerite history. And, and that is you illustrated in Daniel 11.14, if you go to Daniel 11.14. It says, and in those times... There shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish a vision, but they shall fall. Okay, the argument here is who is the robbers of thy people? And the Protestants in William Miller's day and age says the robbers of the people was Antiochus Epiphanes. And this is what this is talking about. Death of Antiochus Epiphanes, who of course stood not up against the prince of princes as he had been 164 years dead before the prince of princes was born. This was such a controversy in the Millerite history that it made, it way, made its way onto this sacred chart, which Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. Okay, so for some reason, this particular controversy is put f almost dead center on this chart, okay? And what I'm saying is this is illustrating the significance of Daniel 11, verse 14. The robbers of thy people. It, are the robbers of thy people pagan Rome, as William Miller and the Millerites understood, or is it one of these last Greek kings, as the Protestant world taught during that day and age, or as the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches today? Okay, Seventh-day Adventist Church now teaches that it's Antiochus Epiphanes. All right, so... It's, but we're not worried about that. We're worried about Millerite thought. Okay, so I'm wanting to let you know. Here's what I'm wanting to let you know. Is that verse 14 is a very significant verse. Okay, it's, it's addressing a controversy in Millerite history that makes, the controversy makes it onto the chart. The only, the only outside thing that makes it onto the chart is the controversy that's represented in verse 14. But there's more to this controversy than that. Okay, because the pioneer understanding, and this is stated very directly in Thoughts on Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith, the pioneer understanding is that a power is not introduced into the prophetic narrative 
until it has contact with God's people. All right. And then Uriah Smith later will tell you the first time that pagan Rome has contact with God's people is with the League of the Jews in 161. Okay, but though he says that a power is not introduced in prophecy until it has contact with God's people, it's like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth because in the very same book, he will tell you that the robbers of thy people here in verse 14 is pagan Rome when they come into this history in between the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Paneum. In the year 200 B.C., 39 years before they come in contact with the Jews in 161 B.C. Do you see the, the problem there? Okay, so what I'm saying is this, this, this verse 14 of Daniel 11, it produces a controversy over who the robbers of the people are that is so profound that it makes its way onto the chart. But it also produces a dilemma for Millerite reasoning because Miller, Miller and his followers said, power doesn't get introduced till it comes in connection with God's people. And this is not a history where the Jews are involved. Okay, so... What I'm saying is there's something very provocative about this verse that we need to wrap our minds around. It's obviously been marked, emphasized by the Lord in a couple of ways that should tell a student of prophecy there's something that I need to understand here. So I want to look at verses 13 through 16 of Daniel 11 and, and try to come back and explain how I'm understanding what that's the significance of that is. In verse 13, verse 11, Russia has just unexpectedly defeated the United States at the Battle of Raphia. And then in verse 13 it says this, For the king of the north, this is the United States, For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years. Now it doesn't say he comes in verse 13. It says he shall, shall certainly come after certain years. It's still future tense. Okay? This is not the battle of Paneum yet. This is in advance of the battle of Paneum. Okay? For the king of the north, the United States shall return. He's just got defeated by Russia. And shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. There's the two characteristics of the United States, military and economic might. So though he gets defeated at the Battle of Raphia in verse 11, verse 13 it says he's going to come back, and before he comes back, he's going to rebuild his military and economic might. Okay. Then verse 14 says, And in those times, in these years, where Trump is rebuilding his military and economic power base in those years, and in those times there shall many stand up against Russia, the king of the south. So another thing that Trump's going to be doing here is he's going to be soliciting allies on his side of the story because he's getting ready to retaliate against Russia. And there's other countries that are then going to start standing up on Trump's side of the issue. Are you following me? Okay, now, totally does, shouldn't be in there. It shouldn't be in there. The next thing that is said, and also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Pioneers understood that was pagan Rome. And what I'm saying is, pagan Rome in 200, and, 200 B.C. is typifying modern Rome in our history. And modern Rome, as Tabo rightly said, modern Rome... It don't want to come out into the open until the Sunday law. Okay, it wants to stay behind the scenes. And you know this is so because you know the story of Elijah at Mount Carmel. Elijah was there doing battle with the prophets of Baal and the priest of the grove. And Ahab was there. But where was Jezebel? She's back in Samaria. She's behind the scenes. And certainly the, the, the Carmel battle is certainly typifying the Sunday law. So Jezebel's desire is to be back in Samaria during this history. She does not want to come out in the open. But Daniel 11 verse 14 tells us that she gets forced to come into this history 
against, against biblical rule. Because Rome's not supposed to come into the prophecies till it has contact with God's people. So even though that's a biblical rule, she's forced to come into this history. Okay, so verse 14. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Many are going to stand up against Russia. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now here's the battle of Peniam in verse 15. So the king of the north, the United States, shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of Russia shall not withstand. Neither his chosen people. Russia has some allies too, and Brother Tabo was telling you about those allies. That's what's going to bring him down, just like it brought Mark Anthony down. His allies are going to desert him. Okay, Right when the battle starts, they're going to run away from him. And those that fed from the food of his table are going to desert him. Um, Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now, I want to read verse 15 one more time, and I want you to think it through. Because we're going to go into verse 16, and you've got to think verse 15 through to get verse 16 right. Okay? And this is just, just making the presumption that my claims about the United States and Russia are valid. Okay? I know that maybe not everyone has tested that out, but approaching it from that point of view, verse 15 says again, so the United States shall come at the battle of Paneum and cast up a mountain, take the most fenced cities, and the arms of Russia shall not withstand, neither any of Russia's allies, neither shall there be any strength to withstand against the United States. Okay, But he that cometh against him, but he that cometh against him, who's the him? The him's got to be, term, be determined by the previous verse. The king of the north, okay? But he that cometh against the king of the north, who's the king of the north? The United States, okay? But who comes against the United States? Rome, okay? But he that cometh against the United States shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. When does Rome stand in the glorious land and consume it? Daniel 11, verse 41. Verse 16 is typifying Daniel 11, verse 41. Therefore, the battle of Raphia and the battle of Paneum have to come before the Sunday law. This is your strongest evidence that this, these two battles are marking midnight and midnight cry from my perspective. But this here, notice that it's by his hand that the glorious land is consumed. None are going to stand against him. Once he takes the glorious land, the threefold union is coming into place. This is where the victory is his. Okay? The papacy has established himself on the throne of the earth. I don't know, but Octavius was bummed out because Cleopatra killed herself because he wanted her to be in a cage in that entry. <laughs> yes, but... Uh, so, in verse 36 of Daniel 11, uh, how many minutes do I have? Ten. Ten minutes. In verse 36 of Daniel 11, I want you to see something. I want to put something in place. And I know that Brother Tabo is going to deal with this, but this is important enough to hear more than once if you haven't heard it before. Verse 36 is the classic verse in the Bible that identifies the papacy. Virtually any Bible, uh, what do they call them? Commentator will tell you this. This is the verse that Paul paraphrased in 2 Thessalonians when he, Paul says, the man of sin sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He is taking this from Daniel 11.36. And verse 36 says, And the king shall do according to his will. And this king is the same king that is placed on the throne of the earth in 538 in verse 31. The very last expression of verse 31 says, They shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That is the papacy taking control of the world in 538. And the following verses, verses 32, 33, 34, are going to give you the history of the persecution of the 1260 years. And there's no break in thought. When you get to verse 36, it's still the papal power. 
And it says, and the king, the papacy, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. And it's a matter of public record that the indignation that gets accomplished here is the deadly wound that's delivered to the papacy in 1798 when the 2520 against the northern kingdom comes to a conclusion in 1798 and God's indignation against Israel ends. He is going to prosper. He's going to practice and prosper until the end of the indignation. And Gerhard Damsteed will tell you that all of Miller's prophecies are based upon one concept, that the, the structure of Daniel and Revelation is based upon two desolating powers, paganism, the desolating power outside the church, and papalism, the desolating power in the church. Damsteed nails that down correctly. All of these are based upon that logic, the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. And in 723... The northern kingdom is scattered and 2,520 years later takes you to 1798 and the papacy was going to practice and prosper for 1,260 years and in the middle of this 2,520 is 538 and this 2,520 gives you two periods of 1,260 where paganism tramples down the sanctuary and the host for 1,260 years followed by Papalism trampling down the sanctuary and the host for 1260 years. And verse 36 is saying the papacy is going to practice and prosper till the indignation is accomplished right there. Okay, so he's coming to his end right there. And therefore, verse 36 is typifying Daniel 11, verse 45. Because in Daniel 11, verse 45, the king of the north places the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help. In verse 36, the papal power comes to his end in 1798, and this is typifying Daniel 11, verse 45. You follow the logic? Okay, because in Daniel 11, verse 45... When the papacy comes to its end and none to help, that's during the time that we know as the seven last plagues. And the seven times of Leviticus 26 is typifying the seven last plagues. Okay, so even the 2520 gets connected with the fall of Babylon. So what's my point? My point is this, verse 37. Neither shall he regard, this has to be, the same king. There is no grammatical justification for saying that this is a dif different king than verse 36. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Okay, so I want you to see verse 36. He comes to his end. 1798. Verse 36. Comes to his end. None to help. That's also verse 45. But in verse 37, he's magnifying himself. What's that? That's exaltation. Okay. So what does that tell you? It tells you this. Verse 37 is a new line. Okay. Prophecy is based upon repeat and enlarge. Okay, in the previous verse, the king of the north has been exalting himself, but he comes to his end, period. He's finished. Verse 37 begins to tell us more about the king of the north, but it, the first thing it tells us is that he magnifies himself. So here he is exalting himself again. Verse 38 says this, But in his estate shall he honor a god of forces, fortresses, military strength, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Monetary, economic, and military. Verse 39, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Well, all I want you to see here is that in verse 37... It comes after verse 36, but it has to be a different line. It's still the king of the north, it's still the papacy, 
But the papacy's come to its end in verse 36. So verse 37, there he is all over again magnifying himself. And it can't be something that he does after the close of probation, after the seven last plagues. We know better than that. So you've got to figure out where are you going to put verse 37 in your lineup and uh, lineup on line when you're repeating enlarging, enlarging. And it has to go right here. Right here. Because in verse 14... It says, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, yet they shall fall. Here is the first introduction of Rome into the prophetic narrative. Um, this being verses 13, 14, and then 15. In this history here, papal Rome is brought into history, forced into history when it doesn't want to be in history, and one of the things it does is it exalts itself right here with the promise that it's going to fall. And this is verse 14, but it's also verse 37. Okay, now that's worth seeing because here he's going to worship a God who his fathers knew not. And Brother Taboza already mentioned that in verse... Verse 24, that Trump shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and riches, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Right in this history here, Trump is doing something that his fathers and his father's fathers have never done. He's doing the art of the deal as he goes out and he takes his treaty movements to the world to bring them on board to stand up against Russia. But the key there is he's doing something that his fathers and his father's fathers never done. And this pope in verse 37 and 38 is going to begin worshiping a God who his fathers never worshipped. The key word here, fathers, it ties it in right here. Right here. There is a treaty immediately after the battle because in that history... It was customary, you have a battle all day long, then you have a temporary treaty to go out and pick up the dead bodies and the wounded. You start the war the next day. But it didn't happen that way. Uh, there was a withdrawal and a treaty, and then there was even another treaty after that, if we're understanding it right. Is that right, Brother Nathan? Where's Brother Nathan? Did he, did he, is that right? Okay, so you have three treaties. And don't miss it, because Daniel 11 is not being minor, is not making minor inferences about this history. It's being very specific. Okay, this is where they're going to sit down at a table with one another and tell lies in advance of this battle. And the verses say, in this history, both Russia and the United States are going to be developing a, a military army to go at each other again for real. And it also says that they're going to be seeking to bring allies on board. Many shall stand up against the king of the south. But this battle here, it's going to be so terrible that it looks like the United States is going to get taken off the scene of history. And I believe that's why the papacy is forced to come and bail them out before the Sunday law. Because they're so worried that they're going to lose their key player, the United States, that they're going to come in here and prop, prop him up and worship a God who his fathers, or his, whose fathers knew not. That's the ten kings. But, but God's controlling all of, all of these kings' will. But what is it that in verse 38 that this king of the north, the papacy, is going to offer to this God that his fathers knew not? Gold and silver and precious things. And one other thing. Precious stones, gold, silver, and pleasant things. He's going to boost up the economy, the economic plan that's going on here. In here, brothers and sisters, in here, you have at this table that, that we understand to be Mark Antony and Octavius in past in the typical history. At this table... It's supposed to be two people. It's supposed to be Mark Anthony and Octavius, but there's going to be three. Russia, the United States, and the Pope of Rome is going to get involved. Okay? He's going to be forced into this history to bail out the United States because they've got to keep control of the financial structure 
The financial structure is going to take a big precarious hit right here. But they got to keep control of the financial structure because over here at the Sunday Law, they want to begin to force people to receive the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. And in order to make that happen, you have to have control of the financial structure. Okay, so at this table, typically it was two people, Mark Anthony and Octavius. But the papacy gets forced into it, so you got three players. Okay, the king of the south, that's a dragon. The United States, that's the false prophet. The papacy, that's the beast. This is the story about these three powers that lead the world to Armageddon. They run throughout Daniel 11, and they're right there. And so what? So what? Verse 14 says, this is the verse that establishes the vision. This is where it all takes place. Okay, so this is, this is important stuff to see. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the history of the Millerites that give so much clarity to what you are doing at this time. We were amazed at the, the consistency of the prophetic testimony in Daniel 11, verses 1 through 45. We know that you've told us that much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of Daniel 11 is to be repeated in the conclusion of Daniel 11, and we're seeing these truths be confirmed from many lines of prophecy, but just as significantly, we're seeing it confirmed in the history that's taking place in the world today. And we're beginning to sense that this truly is the repetition of the development of the midnight cry in the Millerite history. And if this be so, then we're on the verge of midnight. And before midnight, you are expecting your people to make a prediction. And evidently, the prediction has to do with this coming surprise attack against the United States by Russia. And that the recognition of this truth is the catalyst that you are going to use to bind off your people in advance to the close of probation as you open the seventh seal and begin to pour the latter rain, the true latter rain, out upon them at the same time that Satan is pouring out a false latter rain upon these very people. We ask that you give us the discernment and the consecration to see the rain that we are supposed to be receiving and to stand upon that foundation and not the foundation that's made of sand. We thank you for being with us throughout these days, especially during this Sabbath, and we ask for your continued presence throughout the rest of these sacred hours. In Jesus' name, amen.